My guest this afternoon is Jim Dirigatis, a music critic, one of the hosts of the Sound Opinions podcast. And integral to his appearance here is that he happens to be the man who wrote what I consider to be the definitive biography of Lester Bangs, which is as good a place to begin as any, I think. Um, did I miss anything? The only, the only biography, uh, but it's nice of you to say definitive, yes. <laughs> well, I'm sure other people have tried. Not that I'm aware of, however. Think, not really, no, no. There were obituaries when he died in 1982. Uh, and, of course, there's Almost Famous, where he makes an appearance uh, portrayed by Philip Seymour Hoffman. Also, sadly, not with us anymore. Yes, another tragic loss. Too, Getting old, too huh? Soon, yes. Um, yeah. Give me, give me the um, vague genesis of how you happened to start because um i reread it this week um i found it on my shelf didn't even have to buy it and there you um, go with the, with the british cover no less yes yeah um and um there's a hell of a lot of work gone into that it must have taken you a long time it, it took about three or four years uh but it, it was uh germinating uh, uh much longer um when i was 17 years old a senior in high school, Hudson Catholic Regional School for Boys in Jersey City, just across the river, Hudson River from Manhattan. Um, I had a, a journalism class and all the smart kids took masterpieces of Western literature and the football team and the wrestlers took journalism because it was uh, simple sentences and short words. <laughs> so I took both. Uh, and uh, I was driving my journalism teacher crazy with questions about, you know, investigative reporting in the wake of Woodward and Bernstein and Silkwood and the new journalism, Tom Wolfe. And uh, what is the difference between journalism and criticism? And finally, uh, he said, you know, you're driving me crazy. Just stop coming to class and go interview a hero in your chosen field. You've got your A. Just uh, give me a break. So I picked Lester Bangs, and uh, uh, I wrote to him uh, via his publisher. I was a little clueless in those days. Uh, I could have looked him up in the New York City phone book. He was listed, although his phone uh, was disconnected because he could not afford to pay his bill. As we learned so, many uh, times in the book, you have to shout at the yes. window. Yes, I had to go. Uh, I had to take the path train to Sixth Avenue and 14th Street and stand in front of Gum Joy Chinese Restaurant and shout, hey, Lester, up at the fifth floor window. And he threw down these keys and let me in. And it was a formative experience in my life. I mean, that day changed my life. He was very much the character you see Philip Seymour Hoffman portray in Almost Famous. Uh, Cameron Crowe met him when he was 17, uh, Lester Bangs, uh, in 1972. And I met Lester when I was 17 in 1982. Uh, and the difference was two weeks later, he was dead, uh, April 30th, 1982. Um, you know, his, his sense of passion uh, for uh, the music and his definition of what criticism was and what good rock and roll was, um, you know, he was so encouraging. I was this fat, clueless kid from Jersey City, and he's asking me, what do you read and, and who do you like uh, to listen to? And what are you excited about? And, you know, I'm like, hey, you're Lester Banks. I'm, I'm nobody, you know, uh, but he wanted to have a real conversation. And I think that's sort of, and that's, I think, what criticism is. It is a conversation between people who care passionately about the art. And uh, I took that from that day forward. It took me a while to begin to get paid to write about music. I was writing for free for fanzines, do it yourself, eight and a half by 11 Xeroxed uh, uh, magazines. And, uh, uh, you know, and so I think everything uh, from my life flowed from that day. It's, um, he made me feel as if I could do it. That, 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 uh, this might jump around a little bit, but but my... My first beginnings with um, being a music critic, although I've never actually considered myself one, was um, when I was kind of the same age as you, meeting Lester. Um, none of the music mags wanted to know me. I lived mm -hmm. 300 miles away from London. I had nothing to offer except <laughs> piss and vinegar. 
you know? Passion, and, um, passion. I, I started a fanzine too. And mm-hmm. there were many, many of them around at the time. Uh, we, you know, people used to trade them, you'd collect them. Um, I think that's very, very much missed now. It's, it's funny how well, writing for a fanzine is very different than blogging, even though it shouldn't be. You think so? You think yeah, so? Very much. I, I don't. I don't really think so. Uh, I think it's it's the same impulse. You know, we could be crotchety old men and say, uh, ah, I was harder in my day. You know, you used to have to sneak into the copy shop in the middle of the night when your friend was working and run off 500 copies on their key card oh, yeah. for free and then yeah. staple them. I, st- I still, like a ghost limb, I still feel the indentation of that stapler in the palm of my hand. <laughs> but I think that, um, you know, First of all, I, I, when you said, I don't know if I'm a critic, I mean, I think everybody who thinks uh, passionately, uh, thinks deeply and cares passionately about the art is a critic. Every single one of us is a critic. And uh, I, I find plenty of, of younger uh, kids, uh, you know, blogging uh, with the same passion I had when I was doing my zine. Um, you know, it, 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 everything is uh, more diffuse today. Uh, so the impact of handing out 100 copies of your zine in the rock club, um, you know, you can blog and, and feel as if you're shouting into the void. But I have this dumb optimism that prevails that if you are a voice uh, that is unique and you are saying things that no one else is saying, you still will find an audience. Now, getting paid <laughs> to write for that audience, well, that's a whole other question, uh, which is almost irrelevant. But that's, but I, I that's, that's always been the case, hasn't it? Always. That's always been the case. It's always been the case. It's just harder today as we witness the death throes of the model of journalism that persisted for the last century. Uh, you know, what's going to take its place? Um, because, you know, in our realm of, of arts criticism, uh, yes, it's vitally important. I think we both believe that. But you know what's more important? Uh, battling disinformation about a pandemic that is killing people. I mean, uh, or or the future of democracy, about who really won the U.S. election, or, you know, your boy Boris over there. You know, it's... Um, <laughs> Uh, we are in dire times where journalism is more necessary than ever, and yet the model uh, that needs to sustain it uh, is uh, financially disappearing. And, you know, I could not have done 20 years worth of investigative reporting that has R. Kelly about to begin trial, finally uh, facing 195 years in prison if convicted of all charges. I could not have done that without the Chicago Sun-Times and then BuzzFeed and uh, finally the New Yorker. I mean, you need uh, the support of great editors and and uh, legal vetting and fact checking. And, you know, uh, sitting and writing a review, um, you know, in your basement or bedroom, uh, you don't need that. Uh, but but for serious forms of journalism, you certainly do. That's very um, wood wood. Bernstein, right there. One yeah, my, well, yeah. One of my all-time favorite movies. It, it it changed how I looked at at writing. Really, I mean, a lot of things did, but that very specifically, because although it was gritty and 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 portrayed as as being, um, it was portrayed as being glamorous. What they did in an hour and a half, but I have no doubt it was excruciatingly hard work. And quite fraught with danger, probably. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when you are bucking powerful systems or powerful people, uh, there is always going to be blowback. And, and yeah, it is riveting and glamorous, but they also have plenty of scenes in that movie, which is what makes it many journalists' favorite. Uh, of them knocking on doors and having the door slammed in their face. You know, yeah. I mean, it is it is uh, 100 trips out and knocking on doors and phone calls before one connects with someone who will lead you to 100 more people of whom 99 will not speak to you. You know, it's tedious in many ways. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that I, uh, uh, you know, get preachy about is how little genuine reporting there is in um, in the arts. 
And we have seen in recent years the necessity for that. Somebody like Harvey Weinstein got away with hurting hundreds of people uh, for decades. So did Woody Allen. So did R. Kelly. We're now seeing Marilyn Manson. You know, and it's it's just because it's quote unquote entertainment, which I find vitally important, uh, life sustaining. Uh, doesn't you know we don't have people with the same journalistic skills uh, uh, telling those stories, and I think sometimes uh, uh, that's a real loss. I mean, you 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 have an office across the way from Sam, who uh, I spoke to last week. Do you, do you think uh, you're in a much better position than I? But do you think journalism is taught in the same way? Yeah, I think the basic skills of journalism are is being are are being taught uh, the same way, uh, and it is easier than ever in many ways uh, because of the internet. You know, we, we have this access to information Woodward and Bernstein would have killed for. Uh, you know, um, uh, it is easier to find people. It is easier to track down documents. It is easier to connect, um, you know, but the challenges are the same. You know, you have to file a dozen Freedom of Information Act requests to still get a sensitive document uh, that the government or, or, or a private company does not want to release. So, um, you know, I, I think the, the uh, yeah, I, I think the, the tools are being taught. It's just that uh, to wield them and to wield them effectively uh, is, is very difficult. I was talking to a colleague I admire enormously, a woman uh, uh, maybe about eight or 10 years younger than me, who's done some extraordinary reporting in the Me Too field. I was talking to her yesterday. And we were comparing notes and she said, you know, for all of this talk, it has not gotten any easier. In fact, it might be harder to get some of these stories published today, isn't it? Is that been your experience? And I said, absolutely. So it's one step forward and two steps back, I think. And, and I guess also when you, it, it's easier now than ever to um, to find the, the opposition point of view or you know once upon a time you might write a story publish it in rolling stone and it would be months and months and months before there was any kind of response coming from the other side but now it's almost it's instantaneous there's an opinion right now as that is the direct opposite of of what you have and i find that i struggle with the internet age because because of that reason when there were when there were gatekeepers, if you like, you got one side of a story, and there was time for it to settle in, and you could dissect it. And now it it just moves so quickly. There's so many opinions immediately, and then it moves on by tomorrow. It's incredible. Yeah, uh, yeah, that is that is true. I mean, you know, the uh, charges for which Trump was impeached. Uh, are enormous. And, and it's like it's forgotten already that he was mm. twice impeached, you know, or what happened on January 6th, you know. Uh, see, but I don't think the bigger problem is the proliferation of opinion. I think the problem is the siloing. The fact that if you are on the right in America today, you can live in a world thinking that the vaccine is a plot by the government to track you and it's putting in microchips. And if someone rings your bell and says, have you considered getting vaccinated? There's a clinic down the block, mobile clinic. Uh, you, they're there to seize your guns. And that Trump won the election. I mean, there are people who seriously believe these things and they are in a media silo. And it's it's one of your, your fellow citizens of the empire. You know, Rupert Murdoch uh, should be cursed and damned to hell for eternity for uh you know there he sees a way to profit by consistently feeding people lies and you know and we have reagan to thank for that in the u.s i mean it was the uh, deregulation of the media industry and the fairness doctrine which said if you had a democrat on for 20 minutes on a sunday morning talk show you needed to balance it with a republican for 20 minutes you know but now you can live in a world and and literally there are flat earthers as you know there are people who think it's a lie that the world is round for God's sake. Um, so we're losing our sense of reason 
And that's what's, I think, most troublesome. You can just live in a world and, and, and uh, you know, believe an absurd theory like QAnon. And uh, it's not a theory to you. You think it's fact. You know, George Orwell, uh, we are entitled to our own opinions. We are not entitled to our own facts. Well, one of, one of the bigger things, and it's very noticeable in the UK, um, and I guess it may be in the US too, which is, the death of the platform, really, or the, or the magazine as a platform. I mm-hmm. I really miss having. You know, we had we had um, sounds, Melody Maker, NME, um, Kerrang, and then there were all the imports from the states: Hit Parade, Circus, <coughs> Rolling Stone, Cream, and it's just um, a wasteland. Apart from Rolling Stone, but I'm not, I'm not sure you can really count it as somewhere to go anymore. They've just been out by, been bought out by a Japanese firm, haven't they? Yeah, I mean they're they're a corporate entity shell now, and Gus Winter runs it for his dad. Is Jan Winter's out of the picture? Um, you know, it used to be possible for a magazine to generate a community in the same way that a movement of bands does uh, and still does uh, even in the internet age. Um, You know, whether you're talking about some emo band or Taylor Swift, you know, we have this in common. And, uh, you know, if you read Cream, you could be uh, an acne scarred, uh, you know, uh, Irish kid uh, in London getting beaten up all the time reinvent- and be inspired to reinvent yourself as Johnny Rot. You could be uh, a woman working at a plastic toy factory in New Jersey uh, and, and put out a single, Piss Factory by Patti Smith. You could be a fat, unlikely Oliver Hardy lookalike like David Thomas and say, well, I'm not going to let that stop me from being the front person of a rock band, Perubu. And, you know, you look at Cream from Lester's era and you see people like that writing in, you know, <laughs> and Lester and the Cream staff saying, well, we ain't got nothing you ain't got. Why don't you start a band? Why don't you write for us? And so it was a real sense of community. I don't know if Rolling Stone ever had that aside from a brief moment at the very beginning. Uh, but, you know, in metal magazines like Kerrang! did, uh, you know, and punk fanzines and and early hip hop uh, like The Source. But, um, you know, it, it's been harder to find a broad community uh, where anybody who cared about inventive rock and roll had to read Cream during its heyday in the 70s. It's, you know, now there are tiny uh, blogs and communities that that cater to a very small niche, but the broader community of, you know, I'm a Black Sabbath fan and I I realize I have something in common with you, a Clash fan, that, uh, you know, so the internet has been a blessing and a curse. You know, I don't think it's a bad idea that a kid in rural upstate Washington, uh, I, I, it was always been romanticized that a kid like Kurt Cobain had to go out and dig to find bands like the Raincoats or the Vaselines. I think now that, you know, one click on the web, you can have access to this music, that's great. Uh, but the fact that it means less because we are not sharing it with a shared community, that's a loss. Pluses and minuses. Yeah, do, do you... I mean, you run your own podcast there. Do you, do you feel it as a as a fan that things have changed drastically? I mean, you, the one thing you can't take away from either of us is we got older, and and when you get older, I mean, when you were when you were you know you first met Lester, did you give a damn about politics in the same way that you're talking about it now? Probably not. No, you know, I think I did. I mean, I was reading voraciously from 16 or so, The Village Voice, one of the great alternative weeklies, uh, a forum that is gone, long gone, not only The Voice, but alternative weeklies in America. And I never saw a difference between the cultural coverage 
that Lester and Robert Christgau were doing on music and the great film critics they had and the new journalism uh, that, uh, that, that I mean, I read it cover to cover, didn't have a sports section, so I didn't have to worry about that. I don't care about sports at all. You know, so I'm reading about uh, the McMartin trial, uh, the great satanic panic of the uh, 80s. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, the great music happens in a context that includes politics and and society and cultural changes. And so, yeah, I was interested from day one. But, you know, I mean, they were equal loves journalism and music. Uh, they, they were, you know, both vital to me, you know, which is why I wanted to combine them and be a music journalist or critic. Yeah. I mean, and I, I, you know, I would say that knowing the audience of sound opinions, you know, I have uh, kids who are 18 to 22, like the ones I teach. And there are uh, fans and listeners who are even older than me. In, in my head, I'm perpetually 22. And it was a very good year in my life. And, uh, and, and I, you know, it always comes as a shock when someone, you know, uh, because you have to have a thick skin. If you're going to dare to criticize anything ever, you know, and I've long since developed that thick skin, you know, but the most common uh, put down is, hey, you're just a fat old man. And those two things always come as a surprise. Oh, I'm fat. You yeah, know, well, yeah, I guess I am uh, old. <laughs> Geez, I'm 22, right? <laughs> I'm not. I'm going to be 57 in September. But in my head, I still have that lust for life. So, yeah, I, I play in a punk band. Where's the Vortis? Thing? Oh, there you go. Play in a punk band called Vortis. Yep. V-O-R-T-I-S. And uh, we took our name from the Vorticist movement, an intellectual movement in the UK uh, just after World War I, uh, kind of kindred spirits to the Dadaists, the Surrealists. Wyndham Lewis was the designer whose, you know, their, their, their emblem was the revolving energy cone. And James Joyce was a fellow traveler before he got old and bitter and blind and Ezra Pound before he became a fascist. Okay, not everybody <laughs> turned out. Um, but the Vortices forwarded the goal of perpetuating violent structures of adolescent clarity throughout life which I think for 1918, 1920s, pretty damn good definition of rock and roll, to live with the lust for life of a teenager, no matter what age you are. That's good. And so, you know, age is, age is, a, uh, yeah, is a construct. I mean, you know, Jesus, we just had an 89 year old woman go to space the first time the other day. Don't get me started on Jeff Bezos, giant phallus shaped rocket and how absurd that is. But I mean, I'm certain that woman has more life in her Wally Funk than, than a few of the kids who sleep through my class, you know, but that's life. You know, there's this, there's this notion that originally comes from Nietzsche, but is, uh, you know, uh, forwarded uh, by the African-American scholar in the U.S., W.E.B. Du Bois, that, uh, that it's the talented 10th. One in 10 people who you meet in life is truly alive, is fascinated with art and politics and religion and sexuality, is a voracious reader and consumer of every art form you can name. Now, this, you know, is corrupted by the Nazis to say that the, that's the Ubermensch and the, the other 90 percent should be exterminated. Right. No, no, no. But Dubois was saying during Reconstruction in the U.S. that it is it is the responsibility of the talented 10th to do two things. Number one, to connect with one another. Because in the combination of these people who so care about every aspect of life is where society moves forward. And number two, to lift up the others. You know, Nietzsche wasn't saying exterminate the rest. You know, he was saying, you know, the peasant who goes home at night after farming for 14 hours a day and just wants to put his feet up and eat his potato soup. He deserves art in his life, too. How do you bring him music? How do you bring him literature? You know, so, you know, I think that's that's what teaching is. <laughs> and, yeah, is, that, uh, yeah. is that something that the um, the new journalism movement also picked up on? Do you think? Because that. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a start. Yeah. New journalism is a, a, a phrase we don't really 
kick about over here like um dirty realism it's very it lives yeah. in america and it's something from over there but you know joan didion had a, a just a wonderful way of writing that was she took you with her is what i'm trying to say yeah yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, you know, new journalism as a phrase, it wasn't new uh, when Tom Wolfe coined it in the 70s. And it's certainly not new now. Uh, I think when anybody talks about it uh, now, it's as literary journalism. But I think the idea of we can bring the uh, techniques of the short story writer or the novelist to journalism and uh, as Tom Wolfe said, it will be more powerful than the greatest fiction because it is truth. Um, you know, I think that that endures. Uh, I just finished uh, the latest book by Michael Lewis, who is a financial journalist, right? For the most part, yawn. I don't have any money. I don't care about the world of money. But Michael Lewis has written a number of extraordinary books from his perspective as someone who cares about finance and numbers, whether it's uh, Moneyball, I don't care about sports, I just told you that, but it's about how numbers can, can be used to enhance uh, Major League Baseball. And, and in this book, uh, Preventable, is about how the systems that were in place uh, from the Bush era, from the Obama era to uh, combat the pandemic we all knew was going to come eventually, uh, were uh, systematically disabled by Trump and, and we are paying the price. Um, you know, he's a great literary journalist and, and we have uh, a number of them today. I think Susan Orlean is remarkable, um, you know, a true hero. So yeah, when I teach, uh, literary journalism, I teach, you know, we start with Truman Capote uh, in Cold Blood and Michael Hare's uh, Dispatches and Joan Didion's uh, 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 work and, and uh, you know, Hiroshima by John Hershey. And we go up to Krakauer and Lewis and Orlean and, and people who are still doing it today. Uh, I think it's always been rare. You know, it's rare because it's hard. You know, yeah. reporting is hard and, and few people, uh, uh, you know, few, few journalism teachers ever even say that it's hard and it takes dedication and commitment. You know, uh, I, people say, did you ever think you were going to spend 20 years of your life pursuing this R. Kelly story? No. You know, would you have done it if you knew that you were signing up for this? Um I just think if you're a journalist and the phone rings and somebody says, I am being hurt by someone very powerful and no one will listen to me, you're not a journalist, much less a human being, uh, if you don't take that call. So, so that, I think there's... It, was, was that a story that found you? You, you weren't given it by an yeah. editor, it just found you? Yeah, it started with a record review. I reviewed uh, TP2.com, R. Kelly's, I believe, fifth album on the day it was released and, and uh, you know, noted in my review that, uh, you know, the greats in soul and R&B have this dichotomy uh, where, you know, uh, they are hot and horny between the sheets on Saturday night and praying to the Lord on Sunday morning, heaven and hell, sex and redemption. These things are always a fine line that run through Al Green and Marvin Gaye and Prince, but R. Kelly has yet to make a great album because he cannot combine the two. The extremes are jarring. And I got a fax in response to that review. A fax? Said, a fax, yes, <laughs> on the old curly, instantly yellowing fax paper. Dear <laughs> Mr. Dear Goddess, yesterday you compared R. Kelly to Marvin Gaye. Well, Marvin had his problems, but they're nothing like uh, Robert's. Robert's problem is young girls. And that's, that's how that story started. And uh, uh, I, I initially dismissed it. I thought, here is a player hater. Here is someone who is trying to down a successful black superstar. But the level of specificity in that fax, I made one phone call. I called uh, the Chicago Police Department switchboard and mentioned that he'd been under investigation already for two years for sexual contact with underage women, girls. And, uh, you know, I mentioned a, a very Polish sergeant's name. 
Chicago. So I called and I asked for, I spelled it off the fax and the operator said, we don't have anybody here by that name. And I almost hung up. Uh, but I said, well, yeah, 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 wait a second. Is there anybody with a similar Polish surname in sex crimes? And uh, a woman picked up the phone, Sergeant Chinahuski. I said, I'm Jim Diragatis from the Chicago Sun-Times. I'm calling about your ongoing investigation into R. Kelly. And there was a pause. And then she said, oh, I was wondering how long it would be before somebody called about that. I can't talk to you and hung up. And that's why I said, oh, okay, this is a story. Okay. Can you so sort of just give me um, a potted history of, of, of his crimes just for the listeners? Well, you know, the federal trial, one of two, there's a federal case in uh, the Eastern District of New York and Brooklyn, and there's a federal case in the uh, Illinois District. Uh, the Brooklyn trial is about to start in late August. Um, he's charged with some 40 counts of not only uh, continually pursuing underage girls for illegal sexual contact, but essentially being like a mob boss or a drug lord. They are charging him as running a criminal enterprise, wherein everyone who worked for him enabled him to, you know, that no one wanted to derail the cash cow, mixing metaphors yeah, yeah. there. Um, you know, uh, uh, he was generating so much money, a hundred million albums sold at his heyday, that, uh, that you know, we will facilitate his happiness by providing with him with the uh, underage women, which seemed to be his passion, which, you know, is exactly the same story we're seeing with Jeffrey Epstein and possibly Prince Andrew. Although, boy, they're trying to keep him battened down, aren't they? Um, I don't know where he comes among in. Others, and among, you know, Clinton and possibly Bill Gates. And yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, 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 it's the first of, of many that they're going to keep coming. Although I must yeah. say, um, I, my, my one singular thought about the whole thing was how anybody could be surprised with Marilyn Manson was a bit, was a yeah. bit on me. It was kind of, uh, it was kind of expected. or well, not expected, yeah. but you know, he's a strange guy. No, well, I wrote about uh, I wrote about his autobiography, which was co-written by a then New York Times music journalist Neil Strauss when it came out. Uh, you know, in the early two thousands, and there's a horrifying scene in there that depicts a gang rape as uh, something that the woman thought was uh, wonderful, good time, fun. And actually, I tracked her down, and uh, it was quite the opposite. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, what's strange is if you if you watch the uh, excellent hbo documentary on woody allen you know so many aspects of these stories were in full view of the public while being you know seriously battled by very wealthy powerful attorneys and publicity machines on the other side but you know they were denied for so long the facts were out there and it is only you know in this recent cultural moment of Me Too, just like Black Lives Matter, that these things began to resonate. Again, you know, one step forward, two steps back. At least we are having conversations now uh, about race and sex uh, that are vitally important and long, long overdue. How much progress we're making? I don't know. You know, Nirvana was on the top of the charts in 1991 when, uh, you know, uh, Clarence Thomas got put on the Supreme Court, despite a, a brave and heroic African-American woman talking about her sexual uh, harassment by him. And, you know, we just put uh, Judge Kavanaugh on the charts uh, on the Supreme Court for life, despite a very brave uh, woman coming out and 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 saying she was sexually assaulted by him. You know, so I don't know. People say, well, you know, you could never get away with saying something racist uh, or sexist or or that today, and yet people are still getting away with it. I mean, look at Trump. Look at Trump. Sure, but I mean, I, I, my my daughter. I got two daughters. One's 20, one's 24, so kind of, you know, same age as yours. And mm -hmm. she was, um, we had a lot of um, 
there was a lot of racist comments after um, after the England final against Italy yeah. in, in the Euro tournament. And she pointed it out to me and she was saying how how awful it was. And the only thing I could really say, because what you need is a whole a whole generation of people need to turn over. The, the you know the, the generation at the top needs to die off. And as you come up, you bring with you these other values that seep into the generation yeah. below you. And that's kind of how it works. But <laughs> trying to explain that to someone who's 20 is is difficult. Yeah. Because you live in yeah. the moment, not in the in the bigger picture. Well, uh, plus, uh, you know, I'm. Uh, I think we're roughly the same age. You and I are. are uh, I'm a few years behind cusp. you. Okay, all right. So we're on the cusp of Generation X and the Baby Boom generation. Um, you know, and I just think the baby boomers are the most insidious generation in in cultural history, uh, you know, uh, in the West. I mean, you know, this this fucking cultural myopia, you know, uh, I came up with the Beatles and I was at Woodstock. Nothing you, you punk ever experienced in your life will be nearly as good. Fuck you. I mean, look at the damage the boomers have done, whether we're talking W or uh, Trump or, uh, you know, uh, Clinton. I mean, uh, you know, this hubris of, you know, we were the greatest generation. You know, they, they pay lip service to the greatest generation who, you know, fought the Nazis and won. Uh, but really, they just think they're the shit. So fuck them and fuck Woodstock and take your Crosby, Stills and Nash and fucking them too, you know. And it's like, get out of the fucking way. You know, even when I saw this when Cobain died, David Frick, someone I worked with at Rolling Stone, who I never had any respect for, is on MTV every five minutes saying he was the John Lennon of his generation. No, no, fuck you. He was the Kurt Cobain of my generation, and you don't need to compare him to your hero to make him valid right now. And you know what? Right now in the basement somewhere in, in Pilsen in a loft or a basement in Schomburg, there's some uh, woman, uh, you know, who's coming up with a guitar who, who's going to be just as important. So fuck you. That's pretty yeah, much I hate the way it goes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, whether you're talking to your daughter or I'm talking to mine or I'm talking to the students, uh, you know, that Sam and I share at Columbia College, you know, it's like be here now and and don't believe the hype and don't follow leaders. I'm quoting, uh, uh, you know, one baby boomer and one Xer there, Dylan and Chuck D. But uh, uh, think for yourself. And I, I think the biggest skill that needs to be taught today that is vitally important for our survival is media literacy, you know, and it troubles me that, um, you know, this is what leads to this swing to the right, both in the UK and in, uh, uh, in the US, people just getting stupider and, and not being able to discern something that they learned from Rupert Murdoch's tabloid or Fox News uh, from serious reporting in the Washington Post or The Guardian or The New York Times or The New Yorker or Atlantic Magazine, you know, and uh, you have to know who you can trust for accuracy. Well, one, one of the sad things is as, as, you, as you swing to the right and it gets extreme, the left swings in an equal amount the other way, making some of the left is very extreme too. And it's kind of, oh, there's, there's no, I don't know, there's, there's no stable ground anymore, is it? No matter how extreme you want to go, there's probably something beyond flat earth. I mean, we've got hollow earth theories, yeah, well, yeah, got, you know, yeah, there's yeah. always someone willing to just push a little bit more for a little bit more for their 10 seconds in, in the spotlight, I think. Um, you know, I mean, people say that about the left. There's an excellent book uh, I read uh, called Days of Rage uh, by Brian Burroughs, which is an account of the left wing uh, radicalism and terrorism, really, of the 70s, uh, groups like the FLN and the, the people who kidnapped Patty Hearst. And I mean, there was a period in the U.S. of bombings uh, by leftist groups against corporate allegedly warmongering enterprises that lasted for a good five, six, seven years. Uh, 
It was nowhere near as violent as the right wing violence we've seen, whether it's the Oklahoma City bombing or January 6th. Um, but it was there. But I, I just I, so I disagree with you there. I don't think. Look, it is a little annoying to hear, um, uh, you know, some of the left uh, conundrums about, uh, uh, y- you know, the language you know, and is, can you teach a great work of literature if it has the N word? No, you have to, you know, completely, you know, all right. But as silly as the left gets, it is not threatening people's lives. It is not, uh, but with the, you know, by denying science, climate change or pandemic, it is not taking, trying to take away a woman's right to control her own body. It is not condoning rape culture. It, you know, it can be a little prissy and annoying. Yeah, I think, I, I think, I'll take that any day. <laughs> yeah. What I think we have is very different versions of what's right and what's left between between the UK and the US. Over mm. over your way, I think you are so polarized. Whereas over here, it's kind of left and right have has much narrower margins. You know, there's a certain point where yeah. where British people just switch off and. American yeah. people really get involved and take it even further, but uh, such as uh, it's yeah. always been like that way. I think um, when I was talking to Sam last week, he said, "Oh, you," he said, "Don't don't tell him you're a really big Kiss fan till much later on," <laughs> <laughs> just because because Jim thinks they suck, and it's like, but I and I kind of get why you think they suck, but like Sam, they saved my life, and and that's kind of what music is really good at yeah is, is putting yeah. things in front of you that you can that you can latch onto and take with you except i couldn't put my finger yeah. on what that is from kiss apart from you know utter fan you know i was 10 years old it, it was perfect yeah yeah. No, I understand that. I understand that. And but you're making the same mistake uh, that the the boomers make, right? Which is to say, you had to be there, right? If you weren't, if you didn't experience the '60s, you'll never get it. You had to be there, right? Um, well, I disagree with that. You and I could sit down and play Revolver for our early twenty-something daughters, and you know that's a work of art that stands the test of time but can you say that kiss's love gun stands the test of time i mean the misogyny and the uh, you know uh, the, his, uh you know I, the, prob- the problem is when you when you you look at the misogyny it, it as a what's love gun a bit later so you know i did i never as a child i never looked at it like that never ever yeah. only in the last sort of in re- recent history, can you look at it and go, yep, it was pretty misogynistic. Um, but then yeah. it wasn't all rock and roll from 1950, whatever, to maybe the late 80s. You know, most of it was pretty out. Well, I, yeah, I don't really agree with that. Um, you know, but we could have another debate about Kiss some of the time. I have yet to tackle <laughs> Sam about his endless uh, 10,000 word, which was very engaging and very, uh, uh, it was great, obviously, his, his recent epic about loving Kiss, but I just think he's wrong. You know, I think certain things hit you at a certain age. And, uh, you know, for example, I think it's it's not it, it in academia today in America, uh, certainly in our English department, you know, Jack Kerouac and Charles Bukowski, you know, written off. OK, but, you know, on the road changed my life and gave me, me a certain window. And I can now uh, see what what was considered adolescent about it in some ways uh, or Bukowski uh, misogyny and and uh, and self-indulgence. Uh, but I also can see what was great about them. And uh, so, you know, I don't I don't believe in the concept of guilty pleasure. You know, I, I, I've tried long and hard to overcome my 12 years of Catholic indoctrination. So, you know, look, if this brings you joy that's great. There's nothing to be guilty about, you and, know. And that's, uh, that's but but on the other hand, word, since everybody's 
critic, you know, we can have a long discussion about any work of art and agree or disagree. The point isn't to change your mind or for you to convert me. The point is when we discuss a work of art, uh, we are, yes, giving our opinion pro or con, but not to change each other's minds to understand the art more deeply. Some of the, the, the greatest pieces of criticism I've ever read have been attacking art that I loved. I'm not going to back off loving that, but it's going to make me think harder about what exactly I love and why this critic is wrong. We're writing about the art, but we're also writing about ourselves. Because if you and I go and, and see uh, Edward Hopper's Nighthawks at the Art Institute of Chicago, we are going to see two different paintings. We are two different people. I am fascinated to hear what you see in that painting that I have not seen and vice versa, I would hope. And I think that's what criticism is at its best. See, I grew up on, ABBA was my big thing. When I was very small, I was a big ABBA fan and I find it hard pushed to, I mean, that everything they did was so perfect. It was hard mm -hmm. not to like them, you know, as, and as a, as a rock and roller, it's kind of a, a bit strange to go, no, ABBA, they were, they were just wonderful. And then I came from, from ABBA. I went to Alice Cooper, um, to Kiss, to Adam and the Ants, which is kind of, mm. um, which was a very British thing. You couldn't avoid it, but the, Adam and the Ants opened me up to something, um, very different that, that that took me away from while all my friends were being busy uh, getting into Judas Priest and Black Sabbath and Ozzy, I went the other way and and discovered bands like um, the Lords of the New Church, backtrack yeah. to the Dead Boys, and I really like that. Uh, sorry, my point my point is it took the look the strangeness of of the Lords of the New Church to teach me that. Music could say something other than being entertaining, if you like. You know, ABBA didn't sing about anything controversial ever. See, I would disagree with you about ABBA, uh, about, about not singing about anything ever. Um, I mean, they are literally, uh, those two women are they literally wrote, They wrote the book on relationships. Yeah, I, I mean, they're thinking about disintegrating relationships, you know, in full view of the world while presenting, you know, this, this pop veneer. It's very much similar to why uh, there was a big renaissance uh, of appreciation in the underground rock world for Karen Carpenter, uh, you know, a decade or two ago. Um, you know, it is they're singing about pain in this chirping, happy manner, you know, and it, it actually can be kind of deep um and it is perfect and it is you know it's great it's, pop music but when it's presented like that it's easy to pass over what's going on and as you know as a kid you don't see those things you just think winner takes it all is a great song you have no concept of divorce and family destruction at all but so it yeah but i think it resonates in a deeper way you know, you're understand. You, you, you're you're taking this in even as a kid, and realizing that there's something here that I don't quite understand yet. Uh, and I think that's what makes it enticing. I mean, I think that's why, you know, when you're talking about misogyny, I mean, I, I don't think the T-Rex or David Bowie or Roxy Music or the glam era bands from the UK were misogynistic at all. No. I mean, when you hear 10 year old kids say, I you know, was fascinated with David Bowie, Major Tom. Right. And that kid grows up to be uh, a gay man or a trans person. Uh, you know, they were they were sensing something here that was giving them license and liberation, you know, of, of I, you know, fellow freaks unite, you know, and, you know, for, for me, it might have been uh, Husker Du and, and the replacements. And for somebody else, it's Parliament Funkadelic and George Clinton. And for you, it's ABBA and Kiss. You know, it's um, I, I think that what is unique about rock and roll is, uh, and I define that very broadly, I mean, from Buddy Holly and Richie Valens to Public Enemy and Kanye West, right? Um, I think it's a music uh, of the outsider who is uh, celebrating his or her individuality and, uh, and, and freedom uh, to think differently. Uh, and I think that there's, you know, there's very little, I mean, look at 
the fascist misogynistic rock, right? There's very little great rock, you know, uh, that is uh, full of hate and from the right and anti-woman or anti-choice or anti, uh, anti racist, right? I mean, you know, hey, the skinhead movement was existing. And I mean, what if there had been a skinhead band that was as great as Nirvana? But there never was, <laughs> right? And we never have seen, you know, the right had shitty music, you know. So, so, so always, always did. I mean, that, there's something there, right? I mean, you know, uh, 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 yeah, you, you know, why did why did Hitler love Wagner? You know, the the great, uh, you know, romanticization of Nordic myth, right? Uh, uh, and he was a horrible anti-Semite, Wagner, right? You know, uh, but, um, uh, you know, it, it's hard to find like modern examples of classical music. We, there, there was a, a famous Jewish conductor of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, Baron Boim, who took the music of Wagner to Israel 20 years ago, and it was uh, uh, very controversial, right? And he was arguing that the music stands as the music, right? But I don't know, we can't, you know, we don't have to say, you know, but I love the music of Screwdriver, racist skinheads. Right? No, no, there's nothing really good that's that far right. I guess I will defend Ted Nugent, <laughs> up to and including, uh, you know, weekend warriors, right? Um, you know, and he's just despicable as despicable gets. But, but this is the central one of the central problems that the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter is giving the generation of our daughters or my students, separating the art from the artist, right? can you separate the art from the artist? And I think for a very long time among uh, open-minded people, the answer is you have to separate the art from the asshole. You know, plenty of despicable people make great art, but we are seeing now that sometimes the racism or the misogyny is so ingrained, it's part of the art. You know, R. Kelly wrote for 15-year-old Aaliyah Dana Houghton her debut album, and he titled it Age Ain't Nothing But a Number. At the same time, he was sexually assaulting that 15-year-old girl. It's right there. You cannot listen to that for pleasure, in my opinion. There's no right or wrong in arts criticism. If somebody else can make the case that they listen to it and, and love it while, you know, hating his actions, okay. Can we watch Manhattan? I really love Midnight in Paris. I'm a history buff and a reader, right? You know, Hemingway and Dali and, you know, it helps that Woody Allen's not in it. But can we still take pleasure from Manhattan, which is about a 48-year-old comedian pursuing a sexual uh, relationship with a high school girl, Marielle Hemingway? Uh, you know, it, it is exactly what Dylan Farrow uh, has accused her father of, you know, underage uh, sexual assault. Um, you know, Michael Jackson. This is the a good world to be a much poorer, be a, a poorer place if we could no longer enjoy Off the Wall or the music of the Jackson Five. Thankfully, it is not there in the art until the last two albums. It helps that the last two albums, Invincible and His Story, are incredibly shitty. Those are the records that are full of him protesting his innocence. You know, uh, you're trying to crucify me, media, like you crucified the Lord. And, uh, you know, taking on by name the Santa Barbara County uh, District Attorney who charged him and he was acquitted. Um, you know, I think if the evil or the bad acts are part and parcel of the art. I had this conversation with my colleague at the Sun-Times, Roger Ebert, about triumph of the will. We can also add, uh, you know, birth of a nation. Even though these are groundbreaking cinematic works of genius, we cannot sit there and admire Lenny Riefenstahl's brilliant 
camera work of the Nuremberg rally without realizing that we are depicting hundreds of thousands of young men who will march from there to set Europe on fire and destroy the lives of 6 million Jews and homosexuals and gypsies and Catholic, right? You know, I mean, you can't admire just the beauty of that work. I can look at a Picasso, know that he treated women like shit and still admire the Picasso. But such is the personal uh, connection to art that, that if someone says they can't, uh, I'm not going to say he or she is wrong. I think every one of us has to answer this question for ourselves. So to me, Gene Simmons, uh, being, being a disgusting human being and a misogynist, you know, and a greed head, uh, and, and, you know, he, he formed a successful corporation <laughs> is what he did, you know, but, and, but I'm not right. And you're not wrong for loving kiss neither is sam the misogyny thing's a strange one because it's only in hindsight that it's become evident how prevalent it was everywhere not not just in rock and roll you you watch a, a tv cop show from the 70s it's there sure. you read a novel from the 70s it's there you know, i lived through the 70s it was there um yeah but the other thing i was going to say was do, do you think that there is, do you think that the art should be taken out of public circulation under those circumstances? I mean, you don't see no. the Bill, you don't no, see I the mean, Cosby I, I, show on TV anymore. I haven't heard mm-hmm. a Gary Glitter record on the radio for decades. Yeah. And yet. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but you know, it, it, Gary Glitter is still streaming on Spotify. You know, so for that matter is Charles Manson's music. Streaming on Spotify for sale on Amazon. Right? They've kind of become um, a unto themselves as well, haven't they? Yeah, they have. I mean, I think it's it's a commercial decision by the networks not to air Cosby. It was a commercial decision by Warner Brothers to pull from circulation the Speedy Gonzalez cartoons. Do you remember Speedy? Uh, very much. Mask. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't get a Speedy Gonzalez cartoon anywhere uh, on, on, on television. For its depiction no... of uh, a South American yeah. stereotype. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, my wife is Mexican-American, wow. you know, and uh, Speedy's a hero. I mean, if you look at the cartoons, you know, uh, they're very, very funny. Speedy is always getting the better of El Gato Negro, <laughs> El, the, the gringo cat, right? But there's stereotypes in there. Speedy dated my sister. Speedy dated everybody's sister, you know. However, nothing is really gone anymore. It is there. If we want to YouTube it, you'll find somebody. And then, then they get taken down eventually by Warner Brothers copyright, you know, but they'll pop up somewhere else. I don't believe, you know, and Lord knows, neither does Sam Weller, my colleague. You know, uh, we both love Fahrenheit for. 451. Uh, and it's Nazis who burn books, right? I'm not saying take them out of circulation. I'm saying it's responsible. The responsibility of us as consumers of culture is to understand the context of the art. Right. Right. You know, to know where it comes from. So I don't think any art should ever be eliminated. I'm glad Mein Kampf is in print, Uh, you know, because we need to understand we need to understand the context and we need to understand where it came from and to judge for ourselves. Is this good art? You know, when my wife watches, I have a bootleg uh, VHS cassette of, uh, you know, a dozen Speedy Gonzalez episodes, which she watches it. She celebrates. <laughs> Do you know Mexican what? Culture. That's, you know, that's, that's the pinnacle of, of weird having bootleg VHS Speedy Gonzalez cartoons. Right, right, right. It's in, that's that's it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So I don't think Woody Allen's canon of films should be uh, banned or barred. It's it's uh, we're moving to a global digital library where the fact that Cosby's not on TV anymore. Well, anybody who wants access to all those Cosby shows, they can have it. You know. Uh, and they can listen to Fat Albert and they can stream his uh, comedy routines. Uh, it's all there. It's all there. And it's never going away. It just takes, uh, you know, some things are a little harder to find than others. 
but you know, boom, mm. you'll find it in two seconds if you want it. You know, for that matter, if you're a perv, you know, we had Tracy Lords was a porn star in the eighties and then it came out, she was underage and then all the films, uh, you know, were no longer for sale. You know, well, search the internet. Are these the kind of topics that you approach on your podcast or is it much more, um, ref- not refined, but focused um, well, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, we are reviewing new albums. We are interviewing, uh, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, a, a new artist or, or a legend, um, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it's like, it, it is like what magazines once were for you and me, a feature and reviews and maybe some music news, you know, uh, Greg was the critic, uh, at the, Chicago Tribune, the pop music critic for a good 30 years, 25 years. I was the pop music critic at the Sun Times for 15 years. And so we are as interested in doing a classic album dissection of Marvin Gaye's What's Going On as we are talking about the new Lucy Dacus record. So, uh, you know, we have always covered the waterfront and had a broad range of interests. And again, always believe that criticism is a conversation between two people. And the way we look at the podcast or the radio show is you, the listener at home, where we're, you know, the three of us are sitting on the couch in the basement playing records for each other and talking about this art. And it's just that it's virtual. You're at home and me and Kat are at our microphones. Gotcha. Successful? How long have you, how long have you been? Yeah, we're, we've been doing it on public radio nationally we're on about 125 150 public radio stations across oh, the country and it's so it's been weekly for the last 16 years and we have a couple of hundred thousand uh downloads and streams on the podcast globally uh we were just doing a survey of our listeners we have an inordinate amount of uh uh once you get out of the u.s uh, and canada we have a, a ton of listeners in australia God bless them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and New Zealand. We're big down under. That's cool. Yes, uh, the, yeah. Statistics so, can be weird, can't they? When you when you kind of have a look and you're like, wow, people are listening yeah. to my stuff in Portugal. Like, yeah. how or why? Yeah. Very strange. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is bizarre. Just, just to sort of wrap this up a little bit and go back to, um, well, I've forgotten his name. Go back to Lester. I made some... I wrote down some things that you'd written in your introduction. And one of them was, he had said, good rock and roll is something that makes you feel alive. It's something that's human. And I think that most music today isn't. Well, that must have been in the late seventies when he said that. No, he said that that it was in 1982. Okay. So, so still five year. So, and and the, uh, the last record he listened to the record that was stuck in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Was uh, human league? Yes, yeah. yes. I think I think he was talking about um, the encroaching uh, synth movement of the early eighties. You know, yeah, uh, Flock Eagles or Duran Duran or whatever. Um, you know, because uh, he certainly he loved Kraftwerk. You know, and they wanted to be robots. Uh, he loved ABBA, and they were so perfect they weren't almost human, were almost not human, right? Um, I think what he was talking about, and and. I have spent, uh, you know, essentially it sounds hyperbolic, but every day since April 14th, 1982, when I spent a couple of hours with him trying to hone and define this uh, for myself, um, you know, good rock and roll is something that makes you feel alive. It's not strictly a musical form, he said. You know, movies can be rock and roll. And it's not just, I consider Charles Mingus and Hank Williams rock and roll, right? I think, and I'm I'm uh, not the intellect that Lester was. Uh, I think what makes something rock and roll, what what is this art, particular form of art that I love, is the fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, death, fuck you, nihilism, fuck you, misogyny and racism and homophobia, fuck you, anyone who is going to deny me the right to be myself and think for myself. And I see that in, in uh, 
you know, the, the movies of Wes Anderson. I see that in, in, you know, Susan Orleans writing. I see that in, in, uh, uh, most, all of the music I love. Um, I see that in, in a great meal, you know, cooked by a chef. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it, it's, it's an elemental celebration of life and defiance of death. On which note, thank you for your time. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure.